All right, guys, welcome back to our teaching in the book of Revelation. Now, the last time we were here, we were dealing with the events of the great judgment day. But we have to remember is this is a resurrection, a bodily resurrection into eternal bodies, a resurrection of the wicked dead alone. That is the wicked dead from the time of Adam all the way up until the time after the rebellion of Satan in the final great war. And none of these people will be resurrected unto eternal life. And so therefore they will inherit what is called the second death or the lake of fire. And that ends, um, as we know it, the kingdom of the Messiah. And now we step into the eternal age, which is the kingdom of God. That's basically what Paul was referencing in first Corinthians chapter 15, but we're not going to get into that right now. But the idea is after the kingdom of the Messiah comes to an end, that is the temporal order of this world, the temporal order of creation itself. And when I say the temporal order, it just simply means that all of these things in the first creation has an end. And so therefore, after the judgment day, it brings an end to the first creation, the creation of Genesis one and one. Now I'll have more to say about that as we move through the text, but simply the point that I'm talking about here is the end of the reign of the Messiah, the end of Jesus's kingdom, the fulfillment of all prophecy. And now we enter into the eternal kingdom of God. And there is a difference. And I hope you guys are catching that. There is a difference between the temporal and the eternal. The temporal is that which does not remain. The eternal remains forever. Kingdom of Messiah, kingdom of Jesus, when he returns in the second advent, it is temporal. It does not remain forever. The, te the kingdom of God remains forever. And that's the idea that Paul, once again, was stressing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But anyway, so with that understanding, we now move into the discussion of the eternal kingdom and in Revelation chapter 21. Now, I'm not going to try to go a long distance in discussing all of the text in one video because there's so much information involved. It seems that it's just giving us a picture of the eternal kingdom, but it's so much more than that. So to deal with some of the nuances, allow me to break chapter 21 down, maybe in about three teachings, maybe even four, but maybe like two, three teachings. Okay. So let's take our time, look at chapter 21 and deal with the eternal order. But before I get into that, here's a point that I want, want to make when it comes to the old Testament, that is when we look at the prophets, the things that were spoken of by the prophets, the prophets never saw the eternal kingdom. The prophets basically always envisioned the kingdom of the Messiah. Once the Messiah would reign, it would be forever and ever. And the reason is that's all that God allowed them to see. This is again, what we call progressive revelation. That is through John, the apostle who is writing the book of revelation, the letter of revelation. It is through him that God allows us to see what is beyond the kingdom of the Messiah. That which the prophets of old Isaiah, Ezekiel, and the rest were looking forward to. And that, that was the limit of what they saw. John, God tells John that the kingdom of Messiah is only for a time period. That's why I kept using that word temporal. And it is something beyond the kingdom of Messiah. And that will be the kingdom of God himself. Revelation 21. Okay. So I'm glad we got that part out the way. And I hope you guys understood that prophets never saw this. This was only seen through the apostle John. So now let us begin revelation 21 and one. And as I work through it, I do want to let me go verse by verse and, and not read too many verses at once, just a single verse at a time so that I don't miss any of the wonderful thing that God is trying to bring out. I can't get it all of course, but 
some of the major points that God is trying to bring out in the text. Okay. Revelation 21 and one. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. And there is no longer any sea. Now, the first thing John says is after the great judgment day, creation itself. Remember, we talked about that in the previous video and what Peter was saying, how that this earth and this heaven will be dissolved, will be done away with. And when we say earth and heaven, once again, that's simply a merism. That is, it is combining two ideas, earth and heaven to speak of universe. In other words, all of creation from Genesis chapter one has been done away with. The whole of creation is gone and now we have a new creation. So a couple of points that I want to make about that. When he says, okay, okay, let me say it this way. Let me say it this way. Uh, in the Greek text, he says literally, and I saw heaven new and earth new. So what he is literally emphasizing is the newness of creation. That is when we see the world that we have today and the animal kingdom that we have today, the plant life, the insect and the world, as we know it, just take a look around in the natural world, what the right and even the stars in the sky itself, you know, th th that we call the, the constellations and things of that nature, the big dipper and all of that, all of the stars in the sky done away with. And it's a new constellation. The earth itself, it doesn't look like it. The animal life, the plant, it is a completely new and different system. And the thing that's interesting about this in that particular statement, talking about the newness, when we look at the Greek, kai idon orinon kanon kai gain kanain, there is seven words right there, seven words to make that statement in the Greek. It is so similar to when we look at Genesis 1 and 1. Genesis 1 and 1. Bereshith bara Elohim eit ha shamaim wa eit ha eris. Seven words, as it is seven words in this Greek text here, it is also seven words in the Hebrew text of Genesis 1 and 1. My point, Revelation 21, the first part of that, first part of that, I saw a new heaven and new earth. Seven words. Genesis 1 and 1 speaks of the beginning of the original universe. And, it and the reason why it uses those seven words, it deals with the completeness of all things, how it began by God. But the interesting thing is how God chose seven Hebrew words. Now, when we get into the New Testament and we see the new creation, which, and we see the New Testament is written in Greek, God does a similar thing. He except he uses seven Greek words. So as he uses those seven words to talk about the beginning of the first creation in Hebrew, he uses seven words in Greek to talk about the beginning of the second and final creation, the eternal creation. And that's a beautiful concept. But the point is that God is stressing in the text is the newness, not that it's a recreation of the same thing all over again. No, it is completely different. We don't know what planet animal life may look like at that time. Okay. But anyway, so let's move on through the text for the first heaven and the first earth passed away and there is no longer any sea. So it simply means the first heaven and the first earth. That is the heaven and earth of Genesis one and one. The original creation has been done away with. It is now dissolved. It is destroyed. And it's a wonderful thing too, because as we move through the text, we know that original creation was tainted with sin. And so that's also an idea that's working in the background. And we'll see that even further discussed in the text. Sin is done away with. So the sin of mankind, even the sin of the angels that sin themselves who were placed into the lake of fire, sin as a whole categorically 
is done away with. And therefore, this eternal kingdom of God will be a kingdom of righteousness. And that takes us back and takes us even further into this verse. And there is no more, no longer any sea. Now, let me talk about that. It is an interesting discussion. When he says there is no longer any sea. Now, we know that when we look at our world from a globe or from wherever we want to look at it, it is predominantly covered in water. What you have to understand is water is a symbol of judgment. Water is a symbol of judgment. Now, I can't get into this in great detail, but when we go back to Genesis 1 and 1 and remember the relationship that I have already been drawing between this verse and Genesis 1 and 1. Genesis 1 and 1 is a perfect creation. It is a perfect ordered creation. So therefore, when God created the universe in the beginning, Genesis 1 and 1, it was perfect. There was absolutely nothing wrong with it. But by the time we get to verse number two, we see chaos and notice the chaos that we see. The world is completely covered in water. And to make a long story short, and guys, I really can't get into all of the details now. Check out some of the previous videos I made about that. I made a video about it somewhere, but the world, this is basically the kingdom of Satan. Okay. Satan was the first ruler of this world, Ezekiel chapter 28. All right. And we see also alluding to that in Jeremiah chapter four, but I can't get into that. Satan was the first ruler of this world. We know Satan rebelled against God and he also influenced a third part of the angels to go with him in this rebellion against God. God therefore destroyed the kingdom of Satan and this kingdom of Satan was this original earth, the first earth itself. Adam inherited kind of like a second earth. In other words, when God moved, notice in the Genesis thing, God did not make a brand new earth after verse number two, after verse number two, he started to renovate the earth that he had already created an earth that was destroyed or should I say, yeah, destroyed and covered by water, by water. So my point is Satan's kingdom was destroyed and covered by water. Judgment. God used water to destroy his kingdom as a form of judgment. Notice once again, after God had made mankind and mankind, I'm now in Genesis chapter six through nine and mankind had corrupted itself so thoroughly upon the earth. God set to destroy the, the earth again and to destroy mankind with the exception of Noah and his family. How did God destroy the world again? through water. So therefore, when we see water, water, especially in big coverings like that, in this sense, seas, notice we said there's no more seas. It is a sign of judgment. Since this is the new eternal kingdom, there is no more sin. There will be no more seas. There will be no more great waters of judgment. So that's what John noticed. John said when he looked as God gave him that vision of the world itself, that, I, that looking at the whole earth, John said, interesting, the world has always been dominated with seas. He said, but I didn't see any seas any longer. And that brings about the idea. The same thing that we've been saying, I probably spending too much time here is there is no more sin. Sin is done away with. And since sin has been done away with, there will be no more instruments of judgment. You see it now? But anyway, so that's verse number one, a new creation, a new kind of creation and the absence of sin in this eternal creation kingdom of God. Verse number two. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God made as a bride adorned for her husband. Now notice again, we see Jerusalem. So we see now Jerusalem, even though we pretty much see it in, what is it? Genesis chapter 14, 
beginning to be talked about more explicitly, talking about Melchizedek, the one who met Abraham after the slaughter of the king. He was called the king of Salaam, ancient name for Jerusalem, king of peace, okay? City of peace, Jerusalem is. Jerusalem, that which was once temporal, we now see the true Jerusalem, the one which is eternal. And notice it is called the city that came down from God. And this Jerusalem, unlike the previous Jerusalem that we saw on earth up until the time of uh, the second advent of Christ. In comparison, it is a holy city. And this city actually comes down from heaven itself, a city that comes down from God. What this kind of makes my mind wonder is, you remember in John chapter 14 when Jesus said, do not let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe, believe also in me. In my father's house, there are many rooms. It was, if it were not so, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Was it this Jerusalem that Jesus prepared for his people? Nevertheless, it is still the city that comes down from God, a city that God has built. The city that Abraham even, ah, I may not be able to say that. Let me say it this way, was, would inherit in the end of all things, the true Jerusalem that comes down from God. Okay, I hope you, you guys caught that. But anyway, coming down from God and notice it describes the holy city as a bride adorned for her husband. So therefore, the city itself, and of course this assumes the city and its inhabitants, the city will be wedded to someone. And we know that someone will be the lamb, that is Jesus. But now you stay with me as we work through Revelation 21 and 22, of course, to the end, there's more to say about Jesus as the Lamb of God, okay? But not right here. He's just simply talking about the holy city. So it prepares us more for the holy city. And later on, we're going to see in chapter 21, it's going to talk even more about the glory of this bride, the new Jerusalem, okay? Anyway, moving on, verse number three. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men and he will dwell among them and they shall be his people and God himself will be among them. Now this goes to the original desire and intent of God. It has always been the mindset and the desire for God to dwell amongst man, but God never could dwell amongst us because of one thing, Sin. Mankind is sinful and God is holy. One of the very principles, Kodesh, holy, Kodesh, of holiness. Holiness means to be set apart from, set apart from. God's holiness does not allow him to mingle with sin. That's why, guys, I can really talk about this, but I'm not going to deal with it. But for example, when we get into the Old Testament, remember, what do you see happening in the Mosaic law? When God sets the first tabernacle in the, amongst the Israelites, what does he give? He gives the sacrificial system. Notice the sacrificial system deals with the death of animals, the shedding of blood. Why? Because God's holiness does not allow him simply to dwell with sinful men unless sin is dealt with. So here, back again, it has always been the desire and the intent of God to dwell with mankind, but he could not because of sin. But now that sin has been finally forever done away with, now we can see this great tabernacle of God dwelling with me. And the tabernacle of God is not a temple because we see that later in Revelation 21. It's not the temple. It's not some particular building. The tabernacle here is presumed the whole holy city itself. 
That's where God is dwelling and that's where God will be amongst men. Men will also be in the holy city and God himself. No longer in a restricted building because this buildings always kept man from God. That's the idea to keep man from God because you got to deal with the sins. But here, no need of a building because man now is no longer sinful in any way. The nature of man has been changed. Sin has been completely removed and therefore there's the welcoming presence of God amongst mankind. But anyway, enough of that. So tabernacle of God among men, God dwells with them and that's the very idea he tabernacles with them. It takes us all the way back to the Old Testament. You see it now? It takes us... Matter of fact, if you even wanted to put that together in a beautiful way, it even takes you back to the Garden of Eden. For it was the Garden of Eden itself that was the first place that God would come to tabernacle to be with Adam. That's the first place. Then, of course, we see it in the law of Moses. When God told Moses, Exodus chapters 25 through 40, God says, build me a tabernacle according to the instructions that I give you. So I see that again. And then even again in the New Testament, what does it say concerning Jesus? Flesh and blood, uh, 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 the body, I'm sorry, the blood of bulls and goats, God did not desire as a sacrifice for sin, but he built him a body and Jesus with that body, John, Jesus in the body of a man tabernacled amongst us. Same concept. That is the concept of Isaiah, Emmanuel, God with us. But anyway, we don't, we can't get into all of that. But my point that I'm stressing is it has always been God's desire and intention to dwell amongst men. Now, he is able to do that in the finality of things. And now it says, and God will be, they will be his people. God himself will be amongst them. God will be their God. All of humanity, of course, will be serving God. Verse number four, and he will wipe away all, every tear from their eyes. And there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So it talks, remember the first creation ended up being a fallen creation because of sin. And here's basically what we're saying in the restoration of all things, not the, not the kingdom of Messiah, but that eternal restoration, what we're speaking about here, new heaven, new earth, all things associated with the first creation because of sin, sin brings death. Notice that's the first, that's one of the first things that we saw, even though we didn't talk about it ex explicitly uh, concerning the satanic kingdom. Cause Satan's when Satan rebelled, it also brought death. It brought separation. Death, the idea of death is separation, the principle of separation. We're not going to get into all of that, but nevertheless, sin, sin brings death and death brings sorrow. And that's basically what we see taking place in verse number four. And so that's why we see the sorrow of tears. But in this new creation, there are no longer be any tears. Why? There's no longer sin. There's no longer the effects of sin. There is no longer the judgment because of sin. But also too, what we see, we see a reference back for us, mankind, to the Garden of Eden, to the original test of Adam. God said, if you disobey me, eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Now we see death has finally been done away with forever. Okay. And that's the idea here. But also too, it, it speaks to, it, it put this in a, a close time reference, close time reference. Remember the great tribulation. Remember that too? So as the writer, John writes, remember the great tribulation that took place basically in chapters, what is it? Six through uh, 16. We basically see that the tribulation, all of the sorrow, all of the hardships that were taking place, all of the sufferings during that time, as well as the suffering of God's people throughout the ages, we will suffer no more. And that's basically the idea. The first things have passed away. And when he says the first things again, the first 
sinful world. The first sinful creation is no more because now we have a new one. Okay. All right. Let's see. Can we work our way up to verse number seven, if possible or eight. And he who sits on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. And he said, right for these words are faithful and true. So now he says, we have a, a, a voice coming from the throne. Remember, and we go all the way back to revelation in the beginning. Remember the voices that we would hear coming from the throne. Once again, that voice is the voice of God. And we see simply an emphasis on the creation that we have now. It is a new creation. And then he says, behold, I am making all things new. It gives us something to look forward to as well. And he says that this new creation is an assurity. It is a sure thing that God will make. Okay. Then he said to me, verse number six, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts for the spring of the water of life without cost. Now let's talk about that. So the voice continues to talk as he speaks to John. He says, it is done. And, and literally, gagonon, that is a perfect tense verb. Now I don't want to get into Greek grammar, gagonon. Uh, the perfect tense verb. And notice when they translate it, they translated it is done. That is the present tense, the idea and the writers got it dead on the money. The perfect tense here is talking about the surety of those things. Even though God has yet to give this new heaven and new earth, this new creation, nevertheless, it is a sure thing that God will do it and God will give it in this way that God has promised to give it. And then God says, Alpha and Omega beginning and ending. Notice God is not referring to time itself for with God, there is no time. God exists outside of time. Time is a created thing of God. But when God refers to himself, Alpha, Omega, we know Alpha is the first word, first letter of the Greek alphabet, Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. And in relation to that, beginning and ending, okay? God refers to himself as the eternal one. Not only the, and let me say it this way, I think this is a better way to say it, the everlasting one. Like when Moses says, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. From all eternity past to all eternity future, Alpha, Omega, beginning and end. But I think the thrust here is, even as we speak in context that this is the new creation, the thrust is all things have their origin and beginning with God. All things have their ending with which there is none with God. He is the source of all things, the Alpha and Omega, all things have their source of beginning and ending with God himself. In other words, it kind of like brings us to when Moses was asking, uh, he said the children of Israel, remember when he did, delivered the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt, in the book of Exodus, I believe it's chapter three. He said, they're going to ask me uh, what your name is because the Egyptians, God all had names. And God simply says to Moses, tell them I am that I am that self existing eternal God, alpha Omega. I am Elia, Elia. I think that's what it says in the Hebrew. But anyway, so let me, where am I now guys? Okay. Then he says in the second part of this verse, he talks about the promise of life. He says, 
He will give to the one who thirsts. And that simply means the one who is seeking after God, the one who desires God. That is the one who thirsts, right? Remember, Jesus says, come unto me, those who thirst. It is in, is uh, John chapter 7. And he will give them the water. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. Here, God is not simply talking about the Holy Spirit here. God is talking about the eternal age itself, inclusive of him, where God be is, is a father to him. But anyway, without getting all of that, Thirst of him, the spring of the water of life without cost. And simply that is, that is life himself. And we see the relationship again, as I was just saying, how Jesus was saying, come unto me, those who are thirsty. And this is the ultimate, or should I say, penult, penultimate fulfillment of those things, that water of life in the age of eternal. And then he says at the very end, since the water of life, that which makes a person live forever in the bounty of God's blessing. But then he says, without cause. What's so important about the idea of being without cause is this water of life. Remember, the whole thing is not so much as drinking water and living forever. It's the concept of being in the presence of God to enjoy him forevermore in an eternal ordered creation without sin. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. So therefore, what do you think this water would be valued at? This water is priceless. But the idea God is saying is, I will give him priceless water at no cost. All he has to do is trust me, believe in me in this time. So but anyway, that's the idea. So the idea is furthered in verse number seven, he who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son. And so th that's basically what it speaks of. So therefore, all of these things, water of life, blessings, blah, 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 blah. You who believe in God, we who believe in God will inherit the eternal orders, right? When all of this life as we know it, it's over and God will be a son. It speaks of tenderness and it speaks of intimacy. No longer the veil of the tabernacle separates mankind. Okay, that's a beautiful concept. But let's go on here. Now we have a contradistinction. Notice the righteous inherit the eternal age, but the unrighteous do not inherit the eternal age. They inherit the lake of fire, the second death. And this is what verse number eight is talking about. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Okay. And we're going to stop right there as we talk, because this is the very beginning of the eternal age as we intro, that's basically our intro. So he says, is the right, now as far as those who are not righteous, he calls them cowardly and unbelieving. Cowardly could actually speak to those doing, trying to encourage unbelievers, trust God during the time of the great tribulation, the time of great persecution, the time when things are rough, don't be afraid. Remember when Jesus said, believe in him, even unto death, and he'll give you a crown of life. Okay. But if you don't trust in Jesus, receive Jesus, you become cowardly and unbelieving. And therefore you do not inherit these things. And he talks about abominable and murderers and things of that nature and immoral persons. And this kind of gives us a semblance back to Revelation 9 when we saw in the great tribulation, the world would not repent of his sinfulness. And they had certain of these categories that were involved, uh, murders and sorcerers. And a key thing about the word sorcerers, it comes from pharmaca. Now, not only dealing with the idea of working of magic, probably to deal with the demonic world, no doubt that's related, but also it comes from pharmaca, the root of drugs, the word that we call drugs, pharmacy. So it speaks of drug abuse. And we see that 
exploding now and drug abuse will continue to explode until the coming of Jesus Christ, okay? So massive, expansive drug abuse. We see it even now. And idolaters and liars. So in other words, all of the ungodly will finally be di disposed into the lake of fire, the second death, second eternal death. Okay, all right guys, we're gonna stop right there as we deal with the eternal age because as the writer continues, as John continues, he will now begin to focus. Remember, he began to talk about the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down. He will begin to focus on that new city, its quality and its building, construction and things of that nature. But anyway, join me next time as we talk about the new holy city in the eternal order of the kingdom of God.